Hey, Johnny, what an absolute pleasure to have you on. It's so nice to see you. Are you well? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm very well, yeah. I don't mean to sound very su- that surprised, but I, yeah, <laughs> I am. I'm, I'm all right. Where are you? What, you've got all these lovely guitars in the background. Yeah, I'm in, I'm, I'm in this, I've got this studio just outside of Manchester in this old, beautiful, big old uh, factory, which was built in like, you know, 1890-something. And uh, this big old industrial place that I spent way too much time in. <laughs> yeah, but as you can see, it's very light. It's like loads of windows. It's the top floor. Gorgeous. And um, it's one of the, I will say, you know, like living in the provinces or being out of town, out of London. I'm in London, up lots and lots and lots. It's so easy to get around. But uh, being based up here, uh, it, it lets me have places like this. And, you know, I've had it for about six years. And I think I have this feeling that it does kind of seep into the music, the kind of slightly industrial vibe, so to speak. The, the first thing I did when I came in here which about six years ago, I plugged a drum machine into a guitar pedal. None of this pushing a mouse around on a, you know, <laughs> I was like, okay, full on, hu- full on human league. So I like, I, you know, I like the industrial nature of it. I like coming in and every day driving to work and being industrious in a big space. It's because I had so many years, don't wonder if this sounds familiar, but I had so many years in a little windowless rabbit warren you know, doing yep. doing records and movies is still very much like that because of the way you have to do movies. But yeah, so I'm all about windows these days. I feel very, very fortunate. Yeah, love a window. Love a w- I've got a little window here that I can look into the garden, which is extremely peaceful. And also I'm imagining you being near Manchester is really key because for you, obviously, that's where it all started in a time where... You were part of such a massive scene where music and fashion were fused together and there was a movement in place that you were part of. Do you still feel like you need to touch base with that? Well, to be honest, my decision to be here is, a little, is slightly more pragmatic in that, um, I guess it's connected to the past. It's just a great place to run a group and do what I do. I'm not, I'm not particularly a nostalgic person. It's where I grew up. But I think, to answer your question, there's a reason why there's been a couple of really big Manchester scenes over the years. When I started out, 81, 82, 83, the nascent, it wasn't called indie then, but that sort of scene, Factory Records, New Order, Smith, James, blah, blah, all of that. Um, and then that, that then ran into house music and it went on for ages. Um, the reason that that happened is still the sort of same reason in a way that, um, that Manchester is still cool now. It's far enough away from the media central, if you like, to have its own little vibe and its own little rules and its own little codes and fashions. But it's got loads of resources. There's still a lot of places to play, even even in these times. So that's why I was in Portland, Oregon from 2000. I joined an American band, Modest Mouse, from 2005 to 2009, 10. Then I was in the Cribs for a while. But I was still based in Portland, Oregon, in the northwest Pacific Northwest of the States. And when I decided to come back, it was a very practical decision. I wanted my music to have a British edge to it. I wanted to get annoyed by traffic wardens and I wanted to get, <laughs> I wanted to get, not that the traffic wardens in America aren't, any, aren't annoying, but they're a little friendlier. But uh, I needed, to, I wanted to get that British, it was a very deliberate decision to follow a British aesthetic with a British sensibility. I was very clear about that. And Manchester just was a very convenient and very, it was the right decision. It was a good, good, good place to come. I bet. I used to love playing tracks off that Modest Mouse album on the radio. I played quite, I think one of them was my record of the week. What was your first single off that album? Dashboard. Yeah, Dashboard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's an amazing song. I love that track. I love that track. So look, you're, you're in the thick of it now. Back out, you know, because the last time I saw you, I don't know, two years ago or whenever it was, yeah. was when you were out promoting music and you're, you're back out there doing it again. You've got a new album out, which I've luckily had a sneaky preview of and I absolutely love. Um, and you said when you were writing this album, Fever Dreams Parts 1 to 4, you wanted to look inside but make outward-facing music, which I find extremely interesting. So first of all, I'd love to know how you take that look inside and do that self-inventory and also what you might have found in that process. Yeah, I know it's, it might seem a little bit of a kind of um, what's a cryptic statement, but 
Um, first and foremost, I've been doing this so long now from being a kid. Essentially, no matter where you go with a song, I want it to be a good listen. I want for people who are interested in me to hear a track, and it can be a track. You know, it can be upbeat. It can be a more reflective song. It's got to be, a, you know, a good listen. So that's my job first and foremost. But then, at the start of writing the record, you know, I came to, to do the record. Uh, it was time to do an album. So this was just before lockdown. Some of my peers and my friends, they wait to get till they've got all the songs and inspiration strikes and they've got something to say and then they make a record. But I don't do that. It's for 40 years I've been doing this. I go, now is the time to make a record, find something to say, right? So at the start of it, um, I, there was a moment when I was like, okay, wh wh where are you going to go with this? What is it you want to say? Uh, and once those voices start going in your mind as an artist, you, you, you can't really ignore them, you can't evade them. I, 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 not surprisingly, I've learned over the last few albums that when I have reluctantly revealed more of my inner self and when some lyrics I've touched on more autobiographical things, they're the ones that people like most, frankly. And um, that might come as a surprise to people, but my original... Because my original agenda was I wanted to sing about everything except myself because I thought everyone's doing that. Some people do it much, much better than I would. But I felt, okay, you know what? In the back of my mind, I was like, you're going you're gonna to have to connect with people. I wanted to connect with people. I thought it would make me a better writer. It would be braver. It would just be more authentic. And I would be kind of cheating myself if I sort of ignored that. And um, so I then found anyway that Really, a lot of what I do anyway, lyrically, um, is is really singing about perception. That's what I'm, I'm interested in. So I, I find a way of talking about feelings by singing about, a lot of the time, frankly, it's about confusion, of the confusion of, of being human. And I, what I, I, I often turn that on myself, so it, I'm not trying to be too clever about it. You know, on my first album, the lyric says, cogito ergo dumb, which is a sort of, you know, which is, I think, therefore, I'm stupid. You know, it's a little bit of a wordplay thing. And I found that I've, I'm interested in perception because perception covers a lot of ground. It, it covers how we feel about life, how we feel about how we're dealing with other people, how we feel about ourselves, how we feel about the future. And this was just before the pandemic hit. So I started writing a couple of songs. And then I got the call to do the Bond movie, which is a whole other story. So then I kind of got interrupted. But I was already writing this album, Fever Dreams, and I committed in my mind, as I said to myself, I just kind of gone, you know what, you, you, you need to sing about perception. For example, you know, one of the songs is called All of These Days, which is um, um, drinking with my shadow, escape the sensory, another day, tomorrow, tomorrow, endlessly. Because early into the lockdown, I was imagining that a lot of people out there, most, you know, in my audience, there are a lot of people staying up late with a bottle of wine on their own, worried, you know, escaping the sensory. Another day tomorrow, tomorrow endlessly. People were, there was no judgment in that lyric. I was just imagining the way some people in my audience uh, are living at the moment. In the song, the first single, Spirit, Power and Soul is, um, you know, lay awake too long, dark has come, hope, hope is gone. I've seen some glimmer of things, seen some shimmer of things. I'm so dumb, don't you know? Because I think there was an awful lot of People all over the world lay awake at three o'clock in the morning, wondering what was going to happen with the kids and what was going to happen with just just worrying, you know. So, and also, you know, we'll say without getting too gloomy because I'm I tend to be sort of resolve the songs in a sort of positive, almost defiance. That isn't um, deliberate. That's just the way it turns out. I think it's to do with my personality. But I often find if you sat in traffic or you sat at a train station or whatever, people. They look very preoccupied. When you look out at people, they, th there seems to be a, a people who are just, and myself included, worry is a pretty big go-to state. And particularly, obviously, for obvious reasons, in the last couple of years. And um, I was leaning into that a little bit on the record. With, but I tend to resolve it with a sort of sense of positive, positivity. So spirit, power and soul. Basically, the verses are very miserable and the choruses are very upbeat. <laughs> But we, like you say, like when you look around, if you're walking down the street, you're in traffic, we're all in our own heads so much. And we've got all this stuff going on that nobody knows about. We're churning thoughts over, worries, problems, whatever it might be. Do you think 
by looking at yourself, but also looking outside to others, maybe your fan base or just people that you're observing, do you think writing music and getting into those subjects and leaning into them helps you find your own clarity with your own worries and your own things going on in your head? Oh, that's an interesting... I'll tell you what, now you ask that. Well, because I'm in, you know, I'm in the place where I sing and, and, and write these songs. I think there's a, there's a, a bit of an element of a problem shared in a way. And I, also, I am very lucky because I never let... Because I've been doing this so long now, like I said before, it has to be a good listen. And that's kind of a good get out for me. But with songs sometimes, it's a really interesting balance, as you'll know, because you can actually mess a song up by just being too earnest. As, as, as much as you want to emote, you, you, no one wanted to wear Blondie emoting that much. You know, no, <laughs> yeah. you don't, you know, there are some songs that we love that it just, you will just mess it up. But also the reverse is true where one well, with me was that over the, this is the fourth solo album now. And then over the course of writing on my own, I realized that some songs will come out and the music is so emotional. You just have to, honor, you can't be a smart ass about it. You have to honor it with a genuine lyric. And, and that really came home on the last album. I've got this song called Hi, Hello. And the music was so um, pretty and um, evocative. I thought, you, you know, you can't be singing about washing machines. You can't be singing about, <laughs> about whatever it is. You, you have to, you have to, you have to honour this song with something that you really care about. So I, I, so I ended up singing about my daughter, you know, I, I was missing my daughter and, um, and it worked. So I had to break down those kind of barriers of cool. <laughs> I'm trying to work on it now. So on this album, I was presented with, look, I, I was also much like on the last album, I was like, well, I won't write a Brexit album. I won't write a Brexit, even though I was de- dealing with a lot of the, whatever was the, the, fallout from all of that um and i came in at the studio to escape i similarly didn't want i didn't want to be writing an album that was so specific about you know face coverings and the stores being closed and all of that because you know i want to leave i want it to sound poetic i want it to be a good listen i keep saying however there was plenty of scope because i like singing about the human condition there was plenty of opportunity for me to you know the new single says, just want to breathe in the hot spots, you know? So obviously that was watching a lot of the stuff that was going on in uh, daily on the TV that was coming from the United States. And so you can find a good balance where I'm, I'm drawing from being a person in the modern world and it sounding like a rock and roll record. So with the first single that you've mentioned there, because I, I love that song, Spirit, Power, Soul, that is also a subject matter that I'm deeply interested in myself. And when thinking about being a human being, if I'm you know, writing an article or a book, I, I find it too bleak to just think that we are flesh and bones walking around and then we die. I don't necessarily have the language or I haven't quite stumbled upon the right language to use when looking at that something that is bigger, greater, or in, you know, supporting us. But I do believe in it. What are your thoughts around it? What What is your sort of thoughts about spirit, soul, that power? Do you believe in something other? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, how long have you got? <laughs> We've got all the time <laughs> um, in the world. That's what a podcast is. Yeah, well, um, I've been interested in theology, of, you know, and then, then theosophy, philosophy and all sorts of philosophies <laughs> from being a kid really from, from being uh, a teenager and um, you know started off really like the door to it for me was Carl Jung uh, and you know learning about archetypes and stuff like that and then and then I got really my big hero is Aldous Huxley and when people think of Aldous Huxley they think of Brave New World or they think of the doors of perception but in fact this is a man who in, in his later years just, you know, was his lectures when he moved to the United States were just really transcendent. They were incredibly inspirational. And he was the doorway, really, Huxley, for me to learn about all kinds of different ideas of philosophy. And um, I think I managed to, with Taoism, I managed to, um, uh, I got quite interested in reading about that a few years ago and managed to condense, uh, of, of, I guess, a 5,000 year old, very complex philosophy into a sort of 20 second rock and roll statement, which is like, get your shit together and then wing it, is what I understand. <laughs> what a great be. mantra. No, Fern, you know, no, I'm, I'm, um, 
I can do cosmic all day long. I'm, I'm pretty interested in it. I, I think what you know what you were saying about the bleakness of just being flesh and bone and th this being it. I mean, I believe that humans, you know, whatever it is, whether it's this building I'm in now or the technology we're using or, you know, art and the you know, incredible stuff that, that people have done. People have done this with a vision. They've done it with an inspirational vision, whether it's writing a song, whether it's like bringing a family up, gets particularly with adversity, you know, it's inspirational, in, it's in spirit. You know, we all know those times, you know, there's countless books now, you know, and, and seminars and all of this sort of stuff. But I think, I think that culture has really flourished over the last 30 odd years uh, for a reason, because people have got a hunger for it. They've got, they, they need to relate to it. They have a feeling that whoever it is, whether it's Deepak Chopra or Tony Robbins or whoever it may be this week, there's a sort of sense that it's just within our reach mm -hmm. i think that's what that, i think that's what being human is you know it's just within our reach and, and the amazing thing though is about happiness it, it comes to us when we're not noticing we don't go oh you know it's you look it's something when you look back and you go oh man you know when i was watching my kid do the three-legged race or when i was you know doing something stupid or just having this moment there's an amazing philosopher a, a writer in the 60s and 70s called Colin Wilson, he talks about this thing called peak experience. And if anyone, I mean, I know that, I, you know, I was quite aware in my, in my life as a youngster when these things would be happening, that sometimes you would think you were having a peak experience and, you know, nothing was happening, but there was quite, you know, at the risk of being ridiculed. There's plenty of moments in my life where I feel very, very fortunate in that, I've gone, this is a moment. And I'm not talking about walking out on stage at Glastonbury, because that's obviously a moment. Just little things, you know, you catch yourself in that moment. And I think by definition, you know, obviously mindfulness is a big, quite rightly, is, is, a lot of people are interested in that. And I think it's a very healthy thing. I kind of think with mindfulness, when I was a kid, if you saw someone jogging, it was... It was the eccentric bloke down the road in yep. 70 shorts. And it was like, oh, there he is. No one did jogging um, back in the day, did they? Literally, I don't remember a no. single person in the suburbs in the 80s jogging. Didn't see it. Exactly. Whereas now, Everyone. everyone's jogging. Everyone's, jogging. everyone's running. Yep. And um, I kind of think that it may be the case in with mindfulness. This might be something I've read somewhere probably, but um, that, that it just becomes part of what maybe we, we're taught in schools and what we're talking, we're taught in the workplace and... But the thing about that, I think by definition, is you only remember things when you're in the moment. Because if, you're, if your mind is elsewhere, five years later, you're not going to be able to remember it because yep. your mind was on where, wherever else you were going. So I understand this. I, I think it's a very healthy, I don't want to use the word trend, but it's a very healthy kind of evolution um, of a modern society that we're addressing, that people are looking into these issues and addressing these issues. Well, we, need, we need it more than ever. And... You know, as you said a moment ago, it seems because we've got so many brilliant, prolific writers and talkers at the moment, speakers like Tony Robbins, Deepak Chopra, he's been on the podcast and was sensational. We have got more access to, to this sort of thinking and to learning more about connection and meaning and, and all of these things. And like you say, it feels just in reach. But I'm imagining for you being an artist that it feels very in reach at times because... To me, I just see anyone who's producing art as they're either channeling something or they're they're in that flow, that flow state. And I had this, I had a day off work yesterday and I was like, right, I'm getting my paintbrushes out. I haven't painted yeah. for ages and I love painting portraits. And I lost a whole day. It just literally went. And then there was this painting at the end of it. And the whole, and then I was high as a kite. I was literally flying and it felt like I was purely connected to whatever that thing is that I don't know what the name of it is because I don't like to sort of wed anything to a lexicon specifically, but I felt connected to something. Do you feel that when you're, I don't know, writing, performing, is there an opportunity to feel massively aligned or connected? Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, 100%, but I don't give the impression. I think it's more helpful for people who aren't songwriters. Because I think there's a few misnomers about, uh, or misconceptions about, rather, about, about writing songs. But when you, so when, when I've got an idea and I'm, I'm doing it, 
for the first couple of hours, I think it's the greatest song that I've ever heard in my life and no one's ever done anything better. It's better than Hey Jude. It's better than All Along the Watchtower. It's better than Rolling in the Deep. It, nothing's better. And then you calm down about five hours later. But it should be that way. It should be really subjective. And what you were describing with painting, say, well, the amazing thing about that, we all know those times when we've been doing things you forget to eat. Oh, yeah. I didn't even go for a wee for like five hours. None of that. So that's kind of amazing. But um, so, yeah, you do get connected. It's a funny thing that trick of the brain as well, though, that if you're not careful, though, you can psych yourself out. I, I've been asked over the years, you know, advice um, often from young people about best advice about writing songs and, and stuff. And actually what I will say, very, very down to earth thinking is actually very useful. So... In other words, if you get up in the morning and you, you think, I'm going to write the greatest song that's ever been, in spite of what I've just said, if you psych yourself out and you're going to, uh, I'm going to build the, the new Taj Mahal, Mahal you, never get, you never do it. You have to just kind of... To start. There's that famous, there's that, well, there's a famous Picasso quote, which is that inspiration does exist, but it has to find you working. Because there's all these ideas, you know, I, I used to hear about these songwriters when I was younger. Um, I was walking through the supermarket and then I heard this... I second that emotion or, well, <laughs> maybe if you're Smokey Robinson, yeah. okay, that happens. But it doesn't happen to me. You have to be in there. So the good news is, I think for anyone doing anything creative, and this is what I tell people, just get in there and don't be afraid to be crap. Yes. Just just be like, okay, this, you know, with young bands, I, 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 I now go, listen, write 20 songs and just think 15 of them aren't going to be that good. Yep. I, when I wrote my first solo, I mean, I've been writing songs for years by then, but when I did The Messenger in 2011, I'd been playing with the Cribs for a couple of years, and I said to some fellas, look, I've got all these songs, and I've got to do this thing. It was nothing to do with career or any, any great idea. I didn't know how it was going to go. I just said to the fellas, I'm going to write 30 songs. Now, when one of your mates says they're going to write 30 songs, you, you just, just let them either, like, you know... To give them a tranquilizer or <laughs> let them do it, right? But it worked because me and my co producer, I'll be in the studio most every day, and most days it'd be like trying to get a song a day done. And the ones that really came out quite good were the ones where I was just like, oh, this is song 17, let's knock it out. There was one song, uh, it was a Friday afternoon, we, because I'd given myself this get out, if you like, of like, I just write 30, which sounds like a contradiction in terms, but I just went, whatever. Yeah. Because if you go in there, and go, all right, song one is going to be like, this is going to be amazing. You just, you psych yourself out. Yeah. So anyway, I was, I remember it was a Friday afternoon, the sun was shining, I had that feeling that you have on a Friday when you in school, when it's, you know, it's like, all right, it's a Friday afternoon. I miss know, that feeling. It's a double PE, I'm oh, going gonna, gonna to get out of this. And I, I had that feeling, so, and we'd been working really gangbusters all week, and we'd been killing it, and I, I just said to James, who I worked with, I went, oh, listen, listen, we'll knock, we'll knock off at six or whatever, you know. Let me just get this down. I've got this idea. Bang. Because I just took the pressure off, yep. it turned out great. This song called Upstarts. This is it. Like, we had uh, Julia Cameron on, who wrote The Artist Way, and she talked a lot in her books, but also when we were chatting about perfectionism just being a massive block. It's It's almost sort of like the best way to procrastinate is to have perfectionism because you're just sort of stopping yourself from giving it a go. As you say, making mistakes, writing bad songs, painting bad pictures, writing bad poetry, whatever it is, which we all have to do because everyone starts out, you know, either a bit shit or average and you practice and you get better. There's some natural talent there, but you've got to cultivate it. And like you've been saying, you've got to take the pressure off yourself. It's so important. There's something else I wanted to talk about in regards to this sort of connection. And that is, I suppose, synchronicity or maybe alignment. But there's a great story that I read when you were writing this new album. Um, I think it was for the last song. A uh, human. Oh yeah. When you you wanted to write a song that sort of channeled a bit of John Lennon's oomph and tenacity, can you tell us about that? Yeah. Well, uh, one thing that's happened on pretty much all the albums is that I do do the records, and as I, as I'm going along, I, I'm getting a feel for how it's going. And pretty much every record, I've got to the end of it, and I've gone, you really need to write something kind of emotional. Not sappy, but something real kind of connects. And it's the same again with this record, even though I'd sort of done it a little bit 
already there was I had this one tune anyway that I thought would be great to finish the record and um, it's now called Human I, I love the tune and I knew it was going to be the last one sun was shining it was Saturday morning and I was like okay well I'll tackle this song at home and so I had my acoustic guitar and I was wandering around the house a bit and I was everything I was writing was, was a little bit too self-conscious slightly too clever trying a bit too hard and she, you know, as I've been saying, you have, it's a real, you have to sort of seesaw with your mind, this weird thing of like not trying too hard, but obviously you can't just phone it in. And it's a, it's a weird thing with inspiration. So it's a lot of graft sometimes. I don't mean for it to sound like a chore, but that's good news really, I think. So, so I'm wandering around and I was thinking, who, who's, who writes really direct, really, really direct songs? I knew I wanted it to, to be about being a person. I didn't know it was called human yet, but I did know that that was what I wanted it to be about. I thought, and you know, I'm a bit kind of past, I'm not really big on classic rock anymore. I kind of rinsed it to death when I was a kid a little bit. But I mean, of course, I revere all these amazing artists, Bob Marley and whoever else. Bob Marley's another real good one who, who sang in really direct language. But anyway, but I thought, well, there's no getting around it. John Lennon and his solo stuff, you know, like just really direct language. So we've, who hasn't got Beatle books everywhere? So I pulled out a couple of books and on the kitchen top table, I had, I had a couple of books, just pictures of him open and, and laying around and I'm working on his song. And um, bit by bit, I'm chipping away and it's coming. And then the, the doorbell went in the late afternoon. And I, I must admit, I was still grinding. It was, I've been four or five hours on this song outside in the garden, beautiful day. And the um, doorbell went and it was a package from Yoko Ono. It, I have to tell you, Fern, does not send me packages every week. Right. <laughs> no, no, really? This is wild. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was, and of course, I thought, well, I've got to take that as a sign. And this card was beautiful. She said it was a, it was a copy of the new boxed Plasto, Plasticano band reissue record. But no idea how she got my address or whatever. And, um, and she sent me this really lovely little card that said it comes from a time when her... I'm paraphrasing, but it comes from a time when her and John weren't afraid to be open, afraid to be simple. And mm. I was like, and it, I mean, it was, you know. It's perfect. It's a good song. I've got to say, it's a good song. It's a great song. It's an amazing story. It is that absolute alignment. Like when that synchronicity hits, I am like buzzing. I love that shit. That is my absolute favourite when stuff like that happens. Me too. Like in my head, I'm going... I mean, I can go quite out there and I don't care what people think of me. I'm like, John Lennon's up there going, mm, right, we're just going to let Johnny Marr know that this is all going well. Brilliant. Thumbs up. It's awesome. What a great story. It's crazy. It's 100% true. But, you know, this thing about the synchronicity, I mean, I'm, I'm saying to yourself, you know, why, you know, the, so you will, you'll, you will have heard this loads of time. The more open you are to this stuff, the more stuff seems to happen. Yep. However, and I've been through, Periods where I'm just interested in it, you know, so I was interested in all kinds of different, let's say, esoteric stuff. I was yep. always like that as a, as a kid. But what's great, I learned, was that nothing quite sort of puts your feet on the ground, you know, not, nothing quite as good to keep things in balance than having a little four year old throwing their jam sandwiches on the floor from their high chair or oh, you know, yeah. I, what was, and trying to get my kids out of school in the morning. It was interesting, that was a really good period for me for many reasons, but I, I remember thinking, Johnny, you can't be making every connection that's going on in the ether when I, I'm, you know, I've got to get like, get the sort of, <laughs> the, you know, get their stuff together, when, especially when they were little. I'm living it now. I'm living it now. There's so little synchronicity in my school runs in the morning. I can't there tell you, you. It's just, it is what it is. It's telling them to put their shoes on 8,000 times and they haven't cleaned their teeth and you're late and all that jazz. I get it. It's a balance, isn't it? It's like doing the everyday stuff and being present in the moment, but also being open to all that good stuff. And we actually talked to Dave Grohl a while back on the podcast around this subject. And it's it's sort of what you just tapped into a minute ago, sort of saying the more open you are to this stuff, the more it happens. And we were talking about the law of attraction because he hadn't really realised he was doing it as a kid, but he'd kind of built an altar uh, around rock music and wanting to become this rock musician, etc and started attracting all of these amazing situations in. And looking at anyone who's done brilliantly in their career, who's you know put hard graft in, but has had that vision, that sort of 
laser focus vision on something. I guess it just, it sort of is law of attraction because, you know, I read your autobiography, Set the Boy Free, and it seems from a very young age, you know, when you picked a guitar up at the age of five and then you were studying your parents' records and then getting into the fashion and working in clove shops and you were constantly on track with, you know, even if you veered off, you know, back on track, this is my laser point vision to where I want to head. So it is about focus and intention, I guess, to then see things manifest as they have unfurled naturally. I think that's exactly right. You know, I mean, I couldn't put it back myself, but the I've, I've found that, I don't know whether you've come across this over the last few years now, I think this is very good, that there's um, a phrase, if you like, that's come into vernacular, if you like, about luck, about having luck. I, I've, I've seen, I've noticed a couple of actors, cool actors that I like saying it, and it's, to, it's opportunity plus preparedness, preparation. And that is kind of quite logical. It takes the sort of esoteric out of it, if you like, because it's exactly as you said, when I was in my own life, I'm completely obsessed with playing the guitar from being a little boy, obsessed, obsessed. And then I think a certain amount of, and I had a very artistic disposition. I always was, you know, seeing two and two in in everything and coming up with five. I always thought there was something else going on. I, I was sort of, as I say, I was quite interested in these things that I then found out from, what's known as peak experiences is I'll get these in real crazy highs which used to really annoy the hell out of one or two of my mates like my Johnny's happy attacks and um, I used to all of that and and an affair you know, coming from the inner city uh, working class culture there was a, a work ethic from a, coming from an Irish working class family but there was also a, de- a real desperation as well because these dreams that I had. I'm not just talking about dreams about, you know, getting a, a Merc or, you know, having a swimming pool and or being famous and stuff. Just one of, of live, living the life of a musician was what I wanted more than anything, you know? I mean, it's like, just li- I wanted to live the life because the thing for me was that even the crappy bit sounded great, mm-hmm. right? So as a kid, like, you read about these bands in the 60s and they're going up and down the motorway freezing cold in these vans and I was like, sign me up. That yeah. sounds great. So... It, that helps. And I went and knocked on a lot of doors. Uh, I got help from some amazing people, who were very kind to me. And was, as I say, this obsession and desperation. And, um, and I was working all the time, like, on, on what I was doing. I was practicing and practicing. I never had to be told to practice. It was the opposite. Really. Come on, your little brother's got to go to bed. It's now, you know, quarter to 12 at night. And, um, <laughs> but when opportunity did come away, I was prepared, really. There is that as well, and that sounds quite practical to me. That that does make sense. Yeah, I mean, you can't just dream and then hope stuff's going to happen. You've got to have that focus and the expansive mind to believe things are possible. But you've got to, you've got to do the work. You just have to. Like that's a given, isn't it? You've got because that's exactly what Dave said. Because I was sort of Dave, like I know him. Uh, Dave Grohl was saying, you know, when I was talking about did he feel that he was sort of channeling something in that moment of songwriting? And he was like, yes, but you've also got to do the hard graph bit, which is exactly what you've just said with that John Lennon inspired song. You've got to work away at it, but keep the vision in mind. And it's a really, it's a really interesting combination because sometimes with creativity there, obviously there are tons of people out there who think, well, I'm not creative. I could never do anything creative, but everybody's got the propensity to be. You just got to put the work in to, get a bit of a skill set going. Yeah. Would well, you know what's well fun? One thing that I think is, a, is great is anyone can be an expert. And by that, I mean, you don't have to be famous. You don't have to be loaded. You can be, if, you're, if botany is your thing, or if, you know, dogs or cats or whatever it is, is your thing. You can go to bed at night, put your head on the pillow and go, I've done the 10,000 hours. Yeah. It's an interesting thing because... Everyone who I know who is people who've become famous. David Beckham, he's an expert at what he does. You know, he put the hours in and he's talented and he's gifted and, and all of that sort of stuff and all the things we've been talking about. <clears throat> but I'd imagine, I mean, I met him a couple of times, a really cool guy. He, he, knows every, he knew everything about Man United by the time he was 11, right? I've got mates who know, they don't want to be famous and they know everything about certain subjects. So years ago, oh, a few years ago, um, my son, he was like probably whatever, he was in the 16 or something, he was leaving school, about to leave school, he said to me, oh, Dad, said, uh, they want you to come and do a talk. I was like, oh, what, really? He goes, yeah. And I was like, all right. 
we didn't mention it again for a while. <laughs> Months later, it was like, oh God, they've asked me again. I was like, oh really? So I was working on this film, Inception, and um, so I was in LA and they very graciously were like, Johnny's got to get on that plane. He's got to get on that plane. You know, Johnny, can you do another day? And I was like, well, I've got to do the talk up kids' school and all that. They were like, this is on a Christopher Nolan film, right? They were like, he's got to get on that plane. It was so sweet. It's just Hans Zimmer. And, um, but Hans and I have been talking about this thing we're talking about now. And um, I thought, so usually I like to, you know, I've had to do this kind of couple of these things before, really, where, you know, I did talk for in Dublin once, a fellowship. Terrified. Absolutely. You, I go out with a guitar and I'm fine. But anyway, so I thought, OK, well, I was dead busy on the, on the movie. So I thought, I'll, I'll, I'll get it all together on the plane. Anyway, I didn't. I just didn't. I thought, oh, well, how hard can it be? I've just got to go and, go and stand in front of these kids. So anyway, my, my, I got off the plane and I haven't slept. I haven't slept for a couple of days. I've been working on this film about people like sleeping. And, and <laughs> I just I haven't slept for days. Now, Angie, my wife, who I've been with since I was a kid, as soon as she went and phoned her from the airport, she goes, oh, don't scare him. Don't, because she knows when I get a bit psychedelic, right? <laughs> she could tell I was a bit out there. So she goes, listen, don't scare him. So my son comes and picks me up in his little car. I have a shave in the bathroom and the washroom in the Manchester airport, freezing, all that. I'm, I'm spaced out. So uh, I, I, I get to do, the, I get into the school and, um, the teachers, a few of the teachers are like, oh, and I said, what's it you want? What's he want me to talk about? And they were like, well, well, Mr. Ma, you know, <clears throat> well, you, you know, it's, you, you come from humble origins and, you know, it'd be nice if you could inspire the kids rags to riches and, you know, and I was like, okay, right, got it. Yeah, poor kid, makes good, throw in a couple of Liam Gallagher stories, <laughs> got it, off I go. So I walk out there and there's about 200 surly 15 year old boys and girls looking at me like, who's that? He, he's not an old Gallagher, who's that? <laughs> and, and then uh, and the word's like, oh, it's, it's now Mars dad. So, <laughs> Brilliant. Anyway, I start talking and I start delivering this story about rags to riches stuff. And I could hear this, my voice is going, trembling, my knees are going, because I don't, I'm, I'm talking shit. I'm just winging it. And, um, and I just saw after, after five minutes, I just was like, okay, everybody, I'm going to reset, 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 reset. And you can see the teachers sort of getting a bit, you know, like shifting in the chairs like this. And, and, and I went, okay, okay. And because Hans Zimmer and I, before I got on the plane, I talked about like the way you and I are talking now about connections and putting in the hours and all of that. I just took, I, I thought I'll talk about something that I really genuinely feel. So I said, okay, well, I'm assuming that I'm here to tell you about being famous or how, maybe how to make it or be inspired or whatever. And I was like, well, how about we just throw the idea of being famous and being rich? Let's just get rid of that. Let's just throw that away for a minute. You can see the teachers going, oh, where's he going with this? I was like, being an expert, everyone you like, everyone you revere in the culture, whether it's Jay-Z or whoever it is, they are an expert. I happen to know of a certain age, Bob Marley, famously when he was first in the studio, he was 15, 16, as a kid, he was a pain in the ass because he knew on the Drifters records that the backing vocals were supposed to be loud. He knew about Curtis Mayfield's records. He was a pain. He, he really, really knew his stuff. And the point of all of this story though is like, I realized that in telling that story that uh, no one can take that away from you. No. Nope. If you decide that you're gonna be an expert uh, about whatever it is in your field, particularly you now on the internet where there's all this information. You don't need to be famous. You can be any age and no one can take it away from you. It's the best. It's the best, especially when it comes from a place where you love it so much and there is that sort of obsessional quality. Like I've certainly got it about the stuff I talk about these days. I can see it with my son who's nine. He is obsessed with the sea and he'll tell you all the facts about squids, all the facts about octopuses. And it's a joy for him, a joy for us. And as you say, no one can take that. It's not up for grabs. It's it's there and it's to be built on. And actually I've got to do I've got to do a bloody talk at the school in two weeks. Two, and I haven't even thought about what it is, what I'm going to say, so I'm going to take heed of all of this. Because although I, 
you know, I talk on the radio or here all the time with, you know, a certain level of comfort and ease. But when you're in front of a hall of kids, it is terrifying. They are a tough crowd. Tough gig. <laughs> they are not gig. impressed <laughs> at all. But no. what happened, I got an email after that. The next day I got an email from one of the teachers and he said, uh, he said, listen, all the teachers came in just super inspired. Yeah, don't I, about, I, I think the, I felt I don't know about the kids, but <laughs> you know, but I got that from a mate. I had a mate who didn't want to be famous, and he knew everything and does know absolutely everything there is to know about soul music. Yeah, and he's a and he's a great musician, but he just does not want to. He just doesn't want to be in anyone's band, and he's amazing. It's not. But, it's not the be all and end all being out there is it or famous it's about the bit that you get from it which sometimes as you just said is just having the knowledge and knowing it and and just you know working within that it's a beautiful thing i want to know more about the lifestyle that you've created that supports your creativity because i know it's changed over the years and it's a really important thing to look at when we're looking at art and creativity is what your lifestyle is like around that to support it because obviously you can have a debauched lifestyle which might seem to be supporting it, but actually is quite detrimental to it, energy level wise, clarity wise, etc. And uh, these days, and I, correct me if I'm wrong, I think a lot of this started around the modest mouse period, but you've gone bang into long distance running, knocking out 10, 20 mile runs, you know, every few days. And I know you've obviously been long term vegetarian, but more, more recently, perhaps vegan and, and not drinking. Um, not due to any addictive problems, just a lifestyle choice. And I want to know more about that, how you stumbled across these little pillars that work for you and, and support what you do. Oh, uh, yeah, well, I, I um, it seems to calm down a little bit now, but for the last 20... I, I stopped drinking about 23 years ago or something. And, and um, <clears throat> I suppose, you know, when you sit down with a journalist, they've got to talk about something. So quite often a big deal was made of that. And there's quite... I think being a musician... Sometimes there's a, a sort of inference there that you have some sort of drink and drugs hell story, which, or, you know, me and Ozzy Osbourne, I spent the 80s with me and Ozzy Osbourne dangling the children <laughs> off the roof, which I, I didn't, but I believe it or not. No. But, um, you know, I had a great time, you know, and I, I started off uh, very young, you know, I made my first records with the Smiths when I was 19, so I had plenty of stuff to be getting on with. I had a good time. But um, what you're talking about is this... Uh, it's a number of things, really. I got to a place, I guess, in my late 30s where the idea of being that guy who hangs around his mate's dressing room drinking the rider just kind of wasn't a very good look to me. I have kind of thought... And it, it wasn't just a vanity thing, you know. It, it was a, like... It, it sort of spelt, like, a downside to me. And I think what I do, not just because it's my profession, but from being a kid... It's so precious to me. I don't want anything getting in the way of it. And yeah, you know, I had a period in my life, I guess in my 30s, where I was like, you know, off the case, uh, indulging. And I just didn't like where the place I was with it, really. And I definitely don't have a puritanical uh, attitude. You know, I always say if, if I thought that taking drugs and drinking would make me write better songs, then I'd do it. But it, it just doesn't. And then I'm a great kind of... a give her up, give her upper and take her upper of things. But it, throughout my 30s, and I was working with in electronic with Bernard Sumner from New Order. He's a close friend of mine, Bernard. He's a good good guy. He used to say to me all the time, God, you're so obsessive. You're so, God, you're so obsessive. Well, if you get into a writer or if you get into, you're so obsessive. And I, and I listened to that for a long time and I thought, oh, it was quite a negative thing. But then when I got to a point in my life, like my late 30s, early 40s, I realised that actually... Being obs obsessive, I mean, obviously anything in extreme isn't particularly good for you, but being obsessive, actually, particularly about getting energy, is not a bad idea. I kind of was like, huh, right, maybe I should turn this obsessive business on something that is good for me. And what happened with the drinking thing was that I, it honestly wasn't puritanical or judgmental. My, you know, uh, people around me in my band have a few beers and my crew and all of that, I'm fine with it. I'm, I'm not saying they can't, can't be around people boozing or partying or whatever. Although, if someone starts telling me the same thing five times, <gasps> I'm out of there. <laughs> yeah, bye. Particularly myself. But, um, yeah, so it's not a puritanical thing, but um, 
I didn't realise that in psychology there was a there's a thing called appetitive thinking, there's aversive thinking and appetitive thinking, and the clue is in the name, obviously it's appetite. What I did was instead of going, Oh, I'm gonna stop drinking, I'm gonna stop staying up really late, I'm gonna stop smoking pot, I'm gonna I'm gonna give up, I'm gonna give up, give up cigs, give up rock and roll. I actually instead of giving it up, I saw it the other way. I didn't realise it was called appetitive thinking, having an appetite for. I but what I did was I, I Instead of giving something up, I gave myself the gift of sobriety, if you like. It sounds very, I realise that could sound a little bit pompous. But I had a couple of pals, one who'd been in a programme in, in California, that done the AA thing successfully, loved it. And another one who was very vehemently anti that. And you know what? They had really good running gear, they looked... Oh, always with the clothes firm, right? And um, <laughs> Even when running, you got and the I, 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 Yeah, I've heard you talking about it. But um, <laughs> they looked good. And they weren't, they didn't wake up in the morning and apologise for saying some stupid shit the night yeah. before. I mean, I was, I was never horrible, but... And I thought, that, I just thought, that looks good. And I tricked myself, right? So I started buying the magazines and listening to podcasts. And I kind of just fed this obsessive nature and I would like I'd buy running magazines and I'd, I'd be like oh that's a dead cool jacket it's a lemon yellow jacket Where, and I thought <laughs> you, you can't actually buy that unless you're actually running right no. so um, and I would get on a plane with Modest Mouse everywhere in America is you know a five hour flight no matter where you're going so I'd get on a flight we would we, we would be playing in Dallas or something and so I'd be flying back to Portland get on a flight at whatever one o'clock and ordinarily you get off that flight, you're a bit burnt out, you want to just sit on the couch and have pizza and, you know, whatever. Um, but I would, because I know myself quite well, I would listen to podcasts and I would buy magazines. And by the time I got off the plane, I was dying to go for a run. I, yeah. I just, auto-suggestion, I just fed. So I kind of went out of my way and I sort of do that as a musician. I did that when I was young, a youngster. I, I, would, I would find ways of sort of feeding myself stuff that, instinctively I felt was quite useful. And hey, listen, you know, I still, when I get out and run, the first 10 minutes is torture. Yeah, awful. When people, when people, people hear me talk like this, they think, oh yeah, I've got mates who, they hit the bricks at 7.30 in the morning. I'm not like that. I have to procrastinate and mess around with my headphones to get my playlist together. I did it. Then once I'm into it, I never regret it. It's, it's fantastic. And with boozing, all I'll say is if anyone's listening, uh, who've, who've, you know, they're, they're, they're wondering about it. I, I can really recommend it because my mantra, in a way, if I've got one, is no downside. There, there isn't. There re- the only the only weird thing, because I don't really drink. I, I'm, I haven't completely abstained, but I maybe drink a few times a year at like a wedding, a birthday, but I don't drink at home. I don't really drink if I go to a restaurant. And the only, I don't know if it's a downside, but peculiar thing is other people's reaction to it because either they're a bit like what why because it's so ingrained in our culture that you use alcohol to celebrate mark occasions whatever and even my mum will go oh have a glass of champagne come on and I'm like I don't I don't want one I just don't want one I don't want to feel like shit at 2 p.m because I've had a glass of champagne on a Saturday afternoon I don't want one but it is a you have to sort of deal with that a little bit yeah no true and I'm um you know it's the same you know my mate's Drink. And I don't really don't maybe sound like it probably do sound like a killjoy. But what one thing I did find though as well, are quite a lot of events when in my late twenties and thirties when I was drinking, all the events would be the same because I'd be seeing it all through the same goggles. Yeah, I'd be looking at it through whatever champagne goggles or red wine goggles or whatever I was into at the time. And now if I go and have a, if I go and I, I do go and hang out and go to gigs and go and hang out and go to parties or whatever, for whatever events with people. I have a really good time because that event, I'm present and it's... The other thing as well, if it's boring, it's, it's not because... It's because it's boring. Yes, shit. So I'm out of there. <laughs> I'm out of there, <laughs> you know. But generally, I, I have... I, I've just never regretted it. I mean, I'm, I'm very enthusiastic about it. I've got... I don't tri- I'm really careful I don't trip on other people's thing because... It might just been where I was at in my life, but I just was done with it. And I looked at it like every other drug, and I just thought there's better drugs, frankly. I thought if you if you gave me a, if you gave me a pill that made me feel like shit when I've had too many, yeah, of them, I, w- I wouldn't be taking that again. But we fetishize the the wine. We fe- I was just to do it myself, like the you know the label and the whole ri- the ritual of it. And frankly, 
back then, I mean, now I'm such a lightweight, I don't do anything, but back then I just thought, if I'm going to take drugs, I'll do better drugs. And that was just like, that was weed and psychedelics and all of that. I just, I put it in the right, I put it in the context that we don't put it in, which is alongside other intoxicants. And I was like, well, as, as intoxicants go, it's a bit crap. <laughs> It, uh, <laughs> it makes you feel terrible. And you know what you were saying a minute ago about sort of feeding the appetite for running. So, you, you know, imbibing podcasts, looking at magazines, talking to other people that run and then you're geared up for it. It seems like you do that with music as well, because a lot of people who have had great success in one form or another sometimes like to stay within the confines of that and go, you know, this is my success and this is what I do. But you seem to have never really done that. You know, right after your departure from the Smiths, you were working with other people straight away, you know, going to the Pet Shop Boys, Electronic, and then working with the Cribs, Hans Zimmer, all these brilliant people that you've mentioned. You're a prolific collaborator. You you love to work with other people and you're you're seemingly very curious about what other people do and what's coming next. Why do you think that is? Uh, my mother is very, very passionate about music. If I go around this afternoon, she will show me something on YouTube that she's really into and really passionate about it and, and is aware, self-aware of it as well. And so I think it's in my DNA. But, you know, also, um, one of the great things about writing the book, there was a lot of really good things about writing the book um, that surprised me, but it was good that I got to explain my MO to people because when I was... 14, 15, 16, a few years before the Smiths, and very young, I would bounce around from band to band. People would ask me to be in their bands, and, and I would do it. I was in the, the first band I was in with adults, I was, I think I was 14, I might have been 15, but there's a newspaper cuttings of it, and I'm 14. And they were real, they, you know, they, they, frankly, they were reprobates, but I went and they, they rehearsed, they, they had a record out. So that was like, oh my God, they made it big time. But they rehearsed in the red light district of Manchester, which at that time was particularly dangerous or edgy. And I would go there a few nights a week. I didn't know them, but I knew that it would, I thought, well, I'll be better when, I, when I, I've done this with this band. This will be interesting and, and I'll learn something. And I did, I, I did learn a lot playing with that band and my first ever professional gig was with them. And, um, and now I'm just a grown up version of it. It's just, what I do now is this, exactly the same as what I was doing at 15, 16. It's just that I got known right out the gate. My first band was very big and has continued to be well known. And it's quite an unusual thing, you know, to leave a band so young and then, but now, many, many years later, I think people kind of got my MO. You know, I was very, very inspired by Nile Rodgers, not just because of the way he played guitar, but because he worked with Duran Duran, yeah. because he worked with Diana Ross. He, I always pictured Nile quite rightly, this before I got to know him, standing behind a mixing desk with his guitar on, which is what I ended up doing for years and years. So I really related to Nile in that regard. And he, he and I have got a real connection because of that. Well, it's, it's amazing. Like that curiosity means you never get bored because you never get stuck in any one thing. And it's it's probably like the greatest gift to have that innate curiosity. And obviously with all of these different musicians and bands that you've worked with, you bring so much to the table and that's why they want to work with you. They know that you're going to be intrigued and you're going to want to work hard and you're going to want to deliver something new. So they're getting something from it. But I wonder, especially now with your solo stuff, what do you get from working with them? Do you take something away each time that then informs the new music you're making? That's a very interesting question because for many years I was, all, I was asked all the time about when am I going to do my own thing? When am I going to, when am I going to form a band? And then when I did it, then people were saying, who do you want to collaborate with? Who do you want to collaborate with? <laughs> people are and, never satisfied. And, honest to God. But, well, do you know what? Um, I realised it was only when I started doing press for this new record that there's the second song on it's called Receiver. I wrote that whilst I was doing the Bond movie because, as, as you'll know, there's a lot of downtime on movies. And uh, when I, 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 for the longest, it was only when I was explaining it, I realised that, oh yeah, it's got kind of a bit of a Bond vibe to it. And it's, it's definitely informed by being around some of the synth players and keyboard players on that movie, and particularly Hans Zimmer. And there's a few, so I think 
My work with Hans over the last few years has definitely seeped into the solo records. It's a great matter of pride to me that I've, I'm the musician who's appeared on more Pet Shop Boys records than anybody else because mm. they've been going so long and their, their, their work ethic is still really high. And that is for a number of reasons, but I love them. But um, because I feel like, with, say with Pet Shop Boys, and I guess with the movies as well, I'm sort of putting the guitar where in some ways it's got no business being. <laughs> I love that. When we did Inception, I was kind of like, when he... When he you know, when he was up for an Oscar and he was number one in Bill in the whatever it is, I was, I was really pleased for the guitar. <laughs> you know, it wasn't really about myself. I was like, yeah, the guitar's back. So, so I kind of, yeah, I like, I like it for those reasons, really. I'm, I've always, I'm just on a mission to sort of keep the guitar in the culture, in modern, keep it as a modern machine, really. Mm, I know. It really pains me some of the time sort of looking at, the chart and as much as I like to keep up with what's going on as well as um, listen to music from the past which I'm deeply passionate about I do worry sometimes I know know it's all phases and it undulates and sometimes there's loads of bands and other times there's not but it feels like we're going for a period again where there there isn't a huge influx of new bands and guitar based music and I, I get a bit scared and think no no like you know that's my passion and my love is listening to guitar based bands or artists but i know it it just keeps coming around again and in different guises and it's just how the music industry works i guess well it's because well you know well yeah but you know that there's nothing really quite does what a guitar music does that's why you know you, when you see these undulations and you see things coming in and out of fashion hey 83 when i first came out with the smiths i didn't do many interviews and I was asked, because Soft Cell were around and Electro was starting to happen, 83, are you the last bastion of guitars? Why? This was like the first year I was out. I was like, no, and I'll tell you why. And then, yeah, and then you know, there was, indie, indie happened. Then again in 87, 88, 89, early 90s with rave culture, yeah. is guitar music dead? I had that for years. No, 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 no. And then round the corner comes Oasis and... Uh, Nirvana, you know, Britpop yeah. and Suede and Blur and then Nirvana, all of that, all that stuff that happens. And then, you know, you, you, you see where I'm going with this. It, it, I'm always asked. Every... However, uh, I played in uh, I played in Japan probably about 2018 or something. I played at a festival and that day I was the only person who had a guitar on the stage. Wow. And that, that kind of concerned me a little bit. But there's a whole load of reasons for it. However... Uh, I do happen to know that it's a fact that guitar sales through the pandemic, the guitar sales have never been so high. How interesting. And isn't that wonderful that people are going, oh, actually, I've got a bit more time on my hands than maybe. I'd like to do something very practical and creative. That's beautiful. I love that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Without a doubt, since the 50s, it's never been so so great. So, you know, whether that... The only caveat I'd say about that is that's great. And I'm absolutely amazed when I see these boys and girls, and there are many, many more girls out doing it on social media in their bedrooms yeah. playing dazzling, dazzling music. But it isn't what a band can do. So it'd be nice if all those different people actually got in the same room and did something kind of like uh, with the chemistry. Yeah. Because you know, that's another thing about what bands are. You know, the, it's all very well sitting on the end of your bed being dazzling. I had a couple of pals like that when I was younger who just could play, you know, could run rings around me, but they, you know, they, when you get them in a room with someone, they were just sucking the thumbs and not knowing what to do, you know. We said, oh, I got into writing songs. It's like, someone's got to change chord, fellas. Yeah. And um, so More bands. it'd be nice if, if that turns into bands, yeah. It will happen, it will happen. As as we've said, you know, it's it's cyclical and it'll it'll all come back around and I'm I'm always going to be there for that. And, and I, you know, as I said at the start of this, I love your new record. I, I think it's brilliant. I love seeing what you're going to do next because it's always different from what's come before and that's always so exciting and um, what a joy to get to talk to you again Johnny Marr thank you so much lovely to see you Fern yeah thanks for inviting me it's been fun 